What's up, guys, and welcome to One Take. Tonight's another News Roundup episode. We're talking Indiana Jones, James Bond, No Time to Die, and the new streaming service, Quibi. I'm Gil, and I'm talking to my brother, Alun. Say hello. Yo. And before we get into it, just a quick reminder that if you're enjoying these videos, make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon to make sure you get notified when we do more videos and the next time we go live so you can join the stream and be a part of the conversation. With that, let's jump into the first news story for today. Alun, Indiana Jones, great franchise, been around for decades. Every movie in that franchise has been directed by Steven Spielberg. But just yesterday, Variety reported that Steven Spielberg has stepped down as the director. So for the first time, an Indiana Jones movie will be directed by somebody else. According to Variety, Steven Spielberg, and here's a quote from, from, uh, from the Variety article, Spielberg will remain as a hands-on producer on Indy 5. According to a source close to the filmmaker, the decision to leave the director's chair was entirely Spielberg's in a desire to pass along Indy's whip to a new generation to bring their perspective to the story. So you're probably wondering, who is going to take the reins? Who is going to take the whip? and direct Indy 5, James Mangold is in talks to take over. You remember who that is, Alun? Uh, Logan. That's right. Logan, 310 to Yuma, most recently Ford versus Ferrari. Now, a couple of other tidbits on Indy 5. A couple of weeks ago, Harrison Ford said they're actually going to start shooting the movie in two months. But then a few days later, he mentioned some scheduling issues and quote-unquote a few script things and said they are determined to get it right before they get it made. Originally, this movie was scheduled for release in 2019, then it was delayed to 2020, then delayed to 2021, and with this latest news, my guess is it might not even come out in 2021. Now, what else do we know about Indiana Jones 5? Not much. We know that it was, at least the latest draft, was written by Jonathan Kasdan, son of Lawrence Kasdan, who wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark, the original Indiana Jones. So our first question with these things, Alun, is what else has Jonathan Kasdan done? Should we have hopes that this is going to be a good movie? Jonathan Kasdan most recently co-wrote with his father, Solo, A Star Wars Story. (laughs) So I can see by the look on your face, how do you feel about that? Doesn't give me a good feeling. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) And I should also point out, George Lucas was involved in the first four Indiana Jones movies. He kind of co-created them with Steven Spielberg. And strangely enough, there's been virtually no mention of George Lucas in any of the articles I've read about Indy 5. I know that for all intents and purposes, uh, George Lucas is retired, Um, So it seems like he's not going to be involved in Indy 5. Steven Spielberg is stepping away. So it feels like this is going to be truly an Indiana Jones for the new generation and maybe some sort of a reboot, even though they haven't said that. uh, They haven't said as much. So throwing all that out at you, Alun, how are you feeling about Indiana Jones 5? What would you want to see in in Indiana Jones 5? Huh. Well, I don't really want to see them try to do what they did in the last one where Indiana Jones is this old man pulling off all these stunts. <laughs> I'd like to see him in kind of like a you know, Sylvester Stallone in Creed type of role where maybe he's starting to become more like his own father. I don't know if I know we had Shia LaBeouf. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't remember <laughs> it. Did, did we like him in uh, Indiana Jones? I don't know. That whole movie was such a mess. I, he was, he was. I don't think he was at the top of the list of what was wrong with that movie. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really have anything specific that I'd want to see out of this. I know James yeah. Gunn. Or, sorry, you said uh, who's uh, writing it? James, James Mangold. <laughs> James Mangold. Yeah. yeah. So I trust him to write it, but I'm concerned about. Uh, wait, no, you said he's directing. <laughs> so, it. He's directing. He's directing. It. I trust him to direct, but I don't trust the writers. No, so no. I'm a little concerned. Yeah, and uh, I feel like this this concept of picking up a franchise years later, 
and you bring back the original cast or the original cast member and he's you know 30 40 years older and you bring somebody new in I can't think of any other instance where that's been successful besides Creed and that's really the only model we have to go off of because if I think what do I want to see in Indy 5 well, like you said, I don't want to see a 70... I mean, he's 77 now, Harrison Ford. And they're probably not going to start filming this for another year or two at least. So he's going to be pushing 80. I don't want to see him attempting to do a bunch of stunts because it's just going to be sad and depressing. So what can you do? You need to have the stunts. You've got to have the adventure. So you've got to put Indy in some kind of a mentor, grizzled old man role. I really can't think of any other way to approach it. And I think they've got to go with a slightly, like I said, grizzled take, because if you try and have too much fun with Harrison Ford, I don't know, I'm just worried it's going to come off as making fun and poking fun at his age and everything. So I don't know, I almost feel like they have to tone down the humor of the series a little bit to uh, to kind of pay respects to, a, to an older Indiana Jones and if you're going to go that route, James Mangold is a good choice because he pulled that trick off with Logan, uh, with uh, Hugh Jackman as uh, as Wolverine. So, Ryder doesn't give me hope. James Mangold does give me hope. And I think we've seen many times where a director will come in, make some changes to the script and help you know bring it and elevate the movie. So hopefully we can see that here. Any predictions alone? So like I said, there's been virtually no details released besides Harrison Ford's returning. Any predictions for this movie? Uh, the one I said. I think he's going to start going into an older man. I don't think they're going to try to do what they did. <laughs> Alun's I, I prediction think, I, is that Harrison Ford will be older in this one than he was in the last movie. <laughs> yes, but my other prediction is that he will act older yeah. as well. <laughs> what do you think about this prediction? I have a gut feeling de-aging technology will be employed for at least one flashback sequence to see a younger Indiana Jones. Yeah, I agree. I and think they will do that. I predict well, we've tackled aliens in the last movie. We've tackled various religious artifacts. I think in this next one, time travel. <laughs> <laughs> I have no basis for that. But I just thought what would, it, what would be cool to see Indiana Jones tackle? You know, some time travel. That'd be cool. Maybe yeah. he bumps into a younger version of himself. I bet they won't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're probably right. But the de-aging technology, I bet we'll see that come into play. Agreed. All right. Okay, let's talk about another aging hero, James Bond. No Time to Die is the title of the next 007 movie. And apparently, Alun, he's going to have plenty of time to die because I, I love that the running time of a movie can make headlines because there's articles all over the place because uh, theater chains have started to release the running time for the new James Bond movie. And it's going to be supposedly the longest James Bond movie of all time at two hours and 43 minutes. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, you you love long movies, right? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people don't enjoy longer movies. I've heard a lot of people say that anecdotally. But I think that tide's starting to turn because these big tentpole movies like Avengers Endgame are starting to push three hours. So I think people are starting to expect longer movies, especially when it's a big movie like this where it's some sort of a conclusion. Which brings me to an interesting point, which is, I think in the past, when an actor has finished their tenure as James Bond, they haven't really treated it as an ending. They just had another James Bond movie, and then a few years, there'll be some kind of a, hey, it is, you bring in a new James Bond character. This Daniel Craig era of James Bond, it feels a, a little bit more like they've tried to have a story arc. There's been a little bit more connectivity between movies, some recurring characters. So I wonder if, because this is going to be Daniel Craig's last outing as James Bond, they're going to treat No Time to Die as an ending to the James Bond series. Now, even though we all know there's going to be another one. But almost in the way that Dark Knight Rises was the end of a Batman series, I wonder if they're going to try and do something similar here. 
I don't know if I'm reading too much into it, but the fact that it is going to have such a long runtime, to me, lends some credence to the fact that they are treating this a little bit more special than some of the previous James Bond movies, and maybe they are going to go for some kind of finality with this next movie. Would you want to see them do something like that? Would you want to see James Bond retire or or perhaps perish in this next film? Uh, I don't want to see him perish, but I do want to see some sort of conclusion. I think that would be pretty nice to see in a James Bond movie. Otherwise, you know, I th- I think the formula has gotten a little stagnant. Mm-hmm. You know, these they, they have been kind of like one-offs in the past. I like the idea of having like, you know, a start and an end to this character. And, hey, you know, in a few years, let's see another uh, another storyline for an alternate James Bond. Yeah. Yeah, no, agreed. I kind of... I, I It was funny because right after Casino Royale, which I remember really enjoying that movie, they came out with Quantum of Solace, which I think was one of the shortest James Bond movies ever, by the way, at, in only one hour and wow. 47 minutes. Yeah, sub two hours. Versus Casino Royale, which was two hours, 25. Skyfall, two hours and 24 minutes. I think Spectre was two hours and 40. But anyway, Quantum of Souls came out right after Casino Royale. And that was probably the most direct sequel we've ever gotten out of the James Bond series. It continued right out of Casino Royale. And the movie was terrible. And I remember at the time, a lot of people said, you know what, in the next movie, we're going to we're gonna stray a little bit away from that. It's not going to be as much of a direct continuation. It's going to be its own story. And that really bothered me because that's not why Quantum of Souls was bad. It was bad because the movie was a complete disaster. It was so convoluted. I still don't know what that title means. I think it was, it was happening around the time of a writer's strike or something. So there's a lot that went wrong with that movie. And it wasn't because it was a continuation of a previous story. I, I've enjoyed the story arc element of, uh, of these movies, and I would love to see some kind of a conclusion um, at the end of No Time to Die. Uh, only other comment I have on this is seeing a bunch of people run around in suits and shoot guns. Really, all it does is get me excited for Tenet coming out in November, Christopher Nolan's new movie. I don't know if you feel the same way. <laughs> Just because of the suits? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a globe-trotting spy movie. I mean, to me, Tenet looks like Christopher Nolan, it, it, what James Bond would look like in Christopher Nolan's hands. Which, funny <laughs> enough, by the way, Christopher Nolan has in the past expressed interest in potentially directing a James Bond movie. Yeah. Uh, that would be interesting. Well, I agree that I can't wait for Tenet. And... <laughs> I am very curious what he would do with a James Bond movie. Maybe we'll get to see it one day. Yeah. I have a feeling we won't just because I think he he really likes to stick to original material. Though, having said that, he directed three Batman movies. So, I guess guess scratch that last comment. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And that brings us to our last, usually I would say last but not least, but I think in this case last, potentially also least, at least in terms of size, Because we're talking about Quibi, the new streaming service that's all about small. It's all about, their tagline is, quick bites, big stories. This is a new streaming service that's going to launch in April. This is unique in that it's a streaming service that's specifically designed to be viewed on mobile phones. And basically, they are spending over a billion dollars to commission a bunch of original short-form work. They're looking at producing over 7,000 episodes of content from that billion dollars. And basically, they're going to have a bunch of, you know, quote-unquote TV shows where episodes will be anywhere between 8 to 10 minutes in length. They're going to span reality shows, comedies, dramas, action, thriller, horror, but so they're going all out. Uh, not only are the shows um, going to have short form episodes at eight to ten minutes, but they're going to support both landscape and vertical. So in the middle of watching a show, you can turn your phone, and it's not just going to you know turn the screen, but filmmakers are actually giving thought to what should this look like if a viewer is watching it vertically. In fact, I think in some cases they're going to film content specifically for you know if you turn your phone vertical, maybe you'll get a closer look at what a character is looking at on their phone, things like that. 
So the reason we're bringing this up today is they just dropped uh, some promotional material, a 30-second trailer for Quibi that tries to explain what the service is all about and just shows a bunch of quick clips uh, of some of these shows that are going to be on Quibi. So Alon, when you first heard about this streaming service, just the idea of doing short-form content, what was your thoughts? You know, What do you think about that? And how has this uh, trailer changed those thoughts, if at all? Uh, yeah, I was definitely skeptical if I'm the target market for a service <laughs> like this. When I, I, I like to watch like hour long shows, like usually when there's a show that's half an hour, I'm disappointed. I'm like, man, I wish I had another 30 minutes of this to watch. Um, after the trailer and seeing the list of content that's coming, I think you and I both agree we're a little skeptical of shows like The Fugitive. Like, how do they get us invested in a show like that? You know, it's, I don't know. But uh, I am intrigued by uh, the horror genre here. Right. Because there are anthology series where you have like a 10 to 15 minute story, you know, and it, it it's enough. So I'm kind of, I, I kind of feel like that it might work for that. Yeah, I 100% agree. So just some of the content, there's, there's if you go to the wiki, the Wikipedia page for Quibi, you can see a whole list of tons of shows that are coming. I picked out a few that looked interesting. So you have The Fugitive starring Kiefer Sutherland, which is going to be basically a reboot either of the old TV series or of the Harrison Ford movie from the 90s. Funny enough, they're doing this Quibi series at the same time they're talking about doing an actual film remake. But anyway, so something like The Fugitive, it's really hard for me to imagine how that's going to work. Because for an ongoing thriller, where it's a continuing story, it just feels like it's going to, if, if they're going to try and create suspense in eight-minute increments every week, I have a feeling it's just going to start to feel ridiculous. Sort of the way 24 felt ridiculous, where each episode is real time. And so what, every single hour of the day, Jack Bauer is getting into some ridiculous situation. So I just have a feeling the absurdity will just be turned up when you shorten that time span to eight to ten minute increments. But then you have a show like Spielberg's After Dark. This is a horror anthology show. And you know what? There's great short films out there. You can definitely create a sense of horror in ten minutes. So I think for an anthology series, this could work perfectly. Um, but... 10-minute increments sounds a little bit gimmicky. The whole landscape vertical sounds a little gimmicky. So speaking of gimmicks, and I love this, for Spielberg's After Dark, this series can only be viewed at night. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't there certain uh, countries where it's light all the time? Uh, yeah. Like Denmark or something? Uh I don't, I don't know about know. that. Oh, delete that. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> so I guess those folks will never be able to watch this show. Huh. Too bad. <laughs> uh, then you've got How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. So I think that, that's based off of a movie, right? You've got Reno 911 at making a return. Punked is coming back. And Untitled Justin Timberlake Project. Oh, and you're a huge fan of Untitled Justin Timberlake Project, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think that punked in Reno 911, like, would I, I think you were saying like comedies could probably work in this format. I don't yeah. know how interested I am personally, but I could see them work. Right. Yeah. You hate laughing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I could see this working for comedies, anthology series. I, I, ha I struggle to see how you make this work with a straight up drama, an action, or a thriller. But at the end of the day, you know, my, my first reaction, like I said, is this just sounds gimmicky and lame. I think part of that's because when I hear short form series online, I think webisodes, which have always been, I mean, pretty trashy. Like you think about the, for Walking Dead, they did these five minute episodes online. You just think garbage like that. But at the end of the day, they're bringing a lot of talented people in. They're bringing Steven Spielberg in. So you know that if you're going to make 7,000 episodes of content, Something is going to stick. There's going to be good stuff on here. Um, but, I, you know, which, what's the ratio going to be? Is it going to be 80% good, 20% bad? We'll see. Did uh, Spielberg quit Indiana Jones for this? <laughs> I know. That's what I, that's what I was wondering. He probably <laughs> thought 
that he was going to work on the fugitive and, and work with Harrison Ford. <laughs> and then he got there, found out uh, it's not the case. He was like, God <laughs> damn it. He's working on punked. <laughs> <laughs> so the trailer that came out today, did that uh, do anything to change your opinion, get you excited? No. <laughs> Yeah, I hated the trailer. I, <laughs> I absolutely hated it. It just felt like my worst fears of this service come to light. It's a bunch of people dancing around, making stupid faces. It felt like a, the kind of commercial, a kind of commercial you would see if you were watching Disney in the middle of the day, and it's geared towards uh, like six year six year olds or something. I I feel like there's two types of people these days. Ones that like quick short content. Other people that want to sit down. And watch long content. I feel like there's no one like in the middle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? So well, we need it. So I got Quibi coming out. We need like long B. That's <laughs> <laughs> 10 hour episodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I didn't care for the trailer, but I also don't think the trailer was really a proper representation of a lot of the content that's going to be on there. It was just a 30 second quick over the top Hey, pay attention to us. We're Quibi. We're coming soon. It so uh, so get ready. Uh, but we'll keep an eye on this one. Um, we'll see uh, in April if any of this stuff is actually worth watching. And don't worry, folks. We will watch it, so you don't have to. And then we'll tell you if it's worth subscribing. <laughs> Speaking of subscribing, I think that wraps it up for tonight. So if you enjoyed this video. Once again, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to this channel, and hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we go live. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, hit that link in the show notes to get over to the YouTube channel so when you have the time, you can watch these videos and see my beautiful face. And while you're at it, make sure to go to surecast.com and check out our many other offerings. We've got Gilville if you want to laugh. Gilville Campfire if you want some chills and thrills. Bone tingling tales of terror, terror roughly every couple of weeks. You've got Saulcast where we talk in detail about every episode of Better Call Saul. We've got Blood Moon where we talk about the upcoming Game of Thrones prequel which apparently will not be called Blood Moon. You've got uh, the One Take Podcast, of course, where all of this gets posted as audio, plus other content, which is exclusive to audio. And finally, you have one of my favorites, Gil Reads Comics, where even if you're not a comic book fan, we will explain comics to you in detail. We have fun with it, and we just have a good time talking about comics. And that's another one that we try to broadcast live every weekend here on the One Take YouTube channel as well. So, so many ways to enjoy our content, and we hope you'll do just that. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next One Take.